Please join me in the responsive call to worship. Lenten people, we near the end of our journey. We cannot stop its progress. It leads to the cross. It leads to the grave. Yet in the sorrows of Lent, there is consolation. We seek it out in the presence of Christ and hope. In the cross of Christ, there is salvation. At the grave of Christ, there is resurrection. God reaches out to us, lifting us from our fallen state. At the last, we will stand with the sure arms of God around us. And we will rejoice, for in the arms of God, the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. In the arms of God, sorrow and sighing shall flee away. And we shall follow the house of the Lord forever. We shall thank and pray, sing praises to Christ in person. Safe in the wondrous love that already surrounds us. Safe in the wondrous love that will surround us forever.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we come a Lenten people. Teach us how to repent. We come an impatient people. Show us how to reflect. We come a diverse people. Remind us all have value. We come unsure of what to do. Help us know your will. We listen to your hear our voice and stop our ears. We look to see your face. Open our eyes. We reach to feel your presence. Unclench our hands. We kneel to know your love. Soften our hearts. We think upon your Son and adore you. We long to welcome you and Jesus too. We ask you to be with us and to help us. Guide, protect, direct in all, all we do. Gracious God who loves, thank you. Gracious God who heals, thank you. Gracious God who helps, thank you. Gracious God who listens, Hear our prayer. Gracious God who saves, we pray to you in Jesus' name. Amen. We are called to be children of the day and not children of the night. Let us approach the throne of grace that we may receive mercy. Our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open us to a future in which we can be changed, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus the Christ, the light of the world, holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy on us. Amen. This is the message we have heard from Christ and proclaim once again to you, God is light. If we walk in the light as Christ is in the light, we have communion with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Amen. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Now in gratitude for what we have first received, let's bring our tithes and offerings before our God.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we know that all gifts do first come from you. We ask you to ever keep us mindful of the truth of who gives, who receives, and where we can always give more of what we are first given. We offer these gifts to you, and we ask you to use them to your glory and help us to use them in ways that glorify you and bring balm to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Tonight's Gospel reading is from the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during summer, and during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus said, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter then said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew as who was to betray him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet and had put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, Where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I have been pondering, well, I think nigh on everything by this point because you know when you have something like this coming up and all the back of your mind says, you got nothing. And sometimes you do. 
And sometimes you just have to wait until what's been put there germinates and grows. So I have been pondering the nature of love. If we were to ask every person here this night for their definition of the nature of love, we would probably get slightly more natures than there are people here. If someone would want, oh, I got another one. That's how it goes. Jesus is washing the disciples' feet. Take a deep breath and exhale because I don't do that. But the disciples, who don't at first know what he's doing, come through being patient and being followers day by day by day. And as Jesus says, you don't know what this is about now, but you will. And they did. And they do. He's teaching. On the night in which his freedom in the world is going to end, he's teaching. He's teaching people so that they can go and teach. Not just so that they can feel better and go on their way and never think of it again. He's teaching them so that they can go and teach in his name and share the love of Christ with all they meet. And it's pretty easy when you're looking down into a newborn's cradle or crib or into that pink blanket the little tyke is tucked into. And that kind of love isn't like any other kind of love, especially if that child is yours, I've, I've been told. It's a pure love, an unexpected love. My brother said he never, never understood exactly what the love of a parent for a child was until he had one, a, a child, that is. And then it changed everything. It changed the relationship between he and his children but it also changed the relationship of their family in the world. It's changed everything. Though on that first day, none of them would have been able to understand that and articulate it, exactly what that would be. So now you're looking down into the eyes. Let's say you're in um, Mall of America. You're looking down into the eyes of this adorable three-year-old who's been yelling since the moment you hit the doors coming in. Not yelling anything that made any sense. Doesn't carry their way about that, but making noise. Oh my, this child is a pro. And you are getting a little bit tired of it. And you're not really quite sure if you can hang on to those brain cells that brought you to this place with a list of things to do. And still, you love that child. The child grows up, the child goes off, the child does things the child shouldn't do. And no matter what that is, you love that child. And all the time, they're learning, not just that they are loved, but they're learning what that means. They're learning by primary example how they could do that for and with others. Now we're on the street. I won't pick a particular one, that'd just be too cruel. We're on the street someplace we don't know. And there's a 
gentleman. It's kind of half laying and half propped up in a gutter. We're on a bus that's going by. And he lifts his head a little bit. And he plops it back down. And goes back to snoozing or zoning or whatever it was he was engaged in when he was distracted by us passing by in our bus. And then we remember that this is a bus that has gone to homeless and the homes that are set aside for vulnerable people, people at risk. We've passed by a couple of rehab centers and picked up people there too. And they're all headed for the downtown court for one reason or another. And a young-ish woman looks out the window of the bus and says, Hillbilly. That's not love. But it may come about from not having had enough at important times in her life. Everyone is worthy of love, and if they're not worthy of it, give it to them anyway. That's what we're told to do. Don't judge between you and someone else. Don't judge between peoples. Don't judge between skin colors. Don't judge between sexual orientations. Don't judge between nothing. Human being, human being. If we can figure those out about each other, we're good to go. Now those of you who have been partnered up for a while, I'm sure can tell me a whole load of sides about the nature of love that I'm not too awfully sure about. But I see them happening and they're beautiful things. I think if we asked each other to sit and think for, I don't know, 10 minutes, I'm not going to do that. But if we did, I wonder how many of us would have difficulty filling that time, just thinking through different kinds of love that we have experienced, that we have received, that we have given to someone else that we have planned for, it all counts. It all counts. And if Jesus is willing to get down and scrub the feet of disciples who have been walking through the dust all day, which is, at that time, ordinarily the lowest on the totem pole of all the servants' jobs, which is why Peter says, not me, you're not going to wash me. And why Jesus says, yeah, I am going to wash you. And here's why. And I think in pondering the nature of love, where I fall, at least to this week, is that it it never ends, it never stops morphing and growing and changing and ebbing and flowing and being kicked away or being embraced. It's, It's like an atom, you know, it's always in the world. It just may look a little different. And if we can manage to both receive and give love away, in equal measure to all those people we love and to all those people we'd rather not. I think we may be approaching the nature of love that Jesus was showing the disciples on the night he was betrayed. So let us go 
and do the same. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious, loving God, we come before you this night with hearts that are filled with so many things. There is so much to think about. There is so much to feel. There is so much to deal with. And there is so much to appreciate. And those are true in all of the facets of our life, not just in a service in a sanctuary. We can get so swamped so easily. 
in return now, and in our hearts, we give you that busyness, those worries, even those joys, to let you do what you know best with them. And we remember that you have always been with us, that you care, that you love, that you chose to grow us. And you have never left us, you have never turned away, you have never, never let us down. And we tried. We didn't always fulfill your wishes. And in good time, you sent Jesus to show us how to live a life that pleases you, the life of goodness and fullness, centered on you, your will, and your love. We remember these things. And we remember that there came a night when Jesus and his disciples gathered in a room. And when they did, they shared what seems to us in the reading like it might have been their last meal together. But again, you stepped in for us. You stepped in for Jesus. And we are still celebrating his feast. We believe that Jesus the Christ was born, lived, died, and is risen. We believe that Jesus the Christ cares for us and all God's children. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, gracious God, send your spirit into these elements of bread and fruit of the vine, that this sacrament may be for us a living reminder, a constant reminder of everything that's gone before, everything you've done for us, everything that Jesus did and still does. We ask you to be with these elements and therefore with us. And we do this in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, I made it too small. This evening we celebrate Holy Communion by modified intention, which is pretty much what we do the first of every month. Please come forward via the center aisle. Elders will be holding patents of gluten-free bread. It's all gluten-free. Receive a piece of bread, eat the bread, and then move whichever side you've come from to the next elder who will have a tray of glasses with unfermented grape juice in them, the fruit of the vine. 
Take a glass, and just the liquid. Leave your empty in these little containers provided for you, and then return to your seats by the side aisles. Now this church of the Presbyterian Church USA and the United Church of Christ believes that God's holy communion is God's gift to all people. You are welcome at this table. Will the ushers please come forward? Please rise and pray with me. Gracious God, we thank you for this blessed and salutary gift 
the body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. And we ask you to help it to live within us and help us to live in your world in the ways that you want. Remind us that we are yours and help us to show it in every way we can. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I say, let the darkness cover me, and the light around me turn to night. Darkness is not dark to you, O God. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. O gracious light, pure brightness of the eternal creator in heaven, O Jesus Christ, holy and blessed. Now as we come to the setting of the sun and our eyes behold your vesper light, we sing your praises, holy God, one in Trinity. You are worthy at all times 
be praised by happy voices, O Christ of God, O giver of life, and to be glorified through all the worlds. O gracious light, pure brightness of the eternal Creator in heaven, O Jesus Christ, holy and blessed. The Shadow of Betrayal, Matthew 26, verses 20 through 25. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. The Shadow of Desertion, Matthew 26, verses 31 through 35. Then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Peter said to him, But, but after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Though all become deserters of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, Truly, I tell you, this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. The Agony of the Soul, Luke 22, 39 to 44. He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and prayed. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet 
not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. The Unshared Vigil, Mark 14, verses 32 to 41. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. In going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass for him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough! The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Father, the hour is come. John 17, verses 1 through 6. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the, o the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They are yours and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. So, may, so they may all be one. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one 
As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. The arrest in the garden, John 18, verses 1 through 5. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew of this place because Jesus often met with his disciples there. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came with lanterns, with torches, and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with him. The Shadow of the Cross, Mark 15, verses 16 through 20. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in a purple cloak. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed and spat upon him and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. And the Word became flesh, and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, 
the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, we gave power to become children of God. And to this is the judgment, that this light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Please rise. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> 